Uh, thank you so much. I know it's the last day of the conference, and a lot of people have already left, but you're still here, and you're in this room, which I really appreciate because I didn't want to just talk to myself. So um, thanks. Uh, my name is Kevin Bushweller. Uh, I'm executive editor of EdWeek Market Brief, uh, and also an assistant managing editor for Education Week. I oversee our coverage of educational technology. So today's, um, today's presentation is about personalized learning and the future of work. And what, what we published a special report in September about the future of work that launched a whole new line of cover, coverage at Education Week. And it's a really fascinating line of coverage. And then we published another special report on personalized learning a few months later. And when I looked at the work we did, I started to see a lot of connections between the two and that there might be some way that personalized learning can help prepare kids better for the future of work, but there are a lot of potential pitfalls and challenges and problems and that kind of thing. So I wanted to just start, I wanted to start with the big picture. <laughs> This summer, I read this book by Thomas Friedman, Thank You for Being Late, which if you've, re if you've read it, you're nodding your head. Um, it is a fantastic book to really get a feel for the challenges we're facing in the years ahead. He's an excellent writer. He probes a lot of areas, including the role of schools in preparing students better um, for the future of work. And I, even though this quote is kind of long, and when I put this together, I thought, oh my gosh, this is taking up the whole screen. But I think it's worth just reading it. Everything that is analog is now being digitized. Everything that is being digitized is now being stored. Everything that is being stored is now being analyzed by software of these more powerful computing systems. And all the learning is being immediately applied to make old things work better, to make new things possible, and to do old things in fundamentally new ways. I think this conference is a lot about that quote, you know, and, and it's a lot about what's going on in the economy. So the pace of change just keeps accelerating. I know I'm feeling it quite a bit, and it's kind of funny too, like at home, I have a robot that's programmed by my cell phone to vacuum our house, and it does a much better job than I did when I was, when I was doing that task. And at work, te the technology, social media, and other forces are escalating the news cycle to a relentless pace that's both, uh, it's both exciting and it's also exhausting, frankly. But many schools are playing sort of a game of catch up um, compared with the rest of society, kind of yelling at the front of the pack, please slow down. And, and that raises a really important question, where, where do they go from here? So this was, the, um, this was that special report I mentioned. So the, the first answer is uh, into, a, into a world of, of tremendous uncertainty, especially in the workplace. But the, the problem is that schools aren't sure what steps they should take to prepare students for the future, and even, even, even frankly, what questions to ask. And that's why Education Week launched that, this, that new line of coverage that I mentioned. So here we have some data about what's going on out there. Nearly half of current jobs in the US are likely to be done by machines when today's kindergartners are adult workers. That is a sobering figure, OK? In 2013, Oxford University researchers published an influential study estimating that 47% of US jobs were at high risk of automation in the next two decades. For this chart, the 2013 analysis was actually applied to data from 2016. So it raises the question, are we on the cusp of uh, the robot apocalypse? Well, maybe not. You know, um, uh, in, in this analysis of Euro, uh, US Bureau of Labor Statistics by the McKinsey Global Institute, Researchers found that in about 60% of occupations, technology could eventually automate a third or more of the required activities. But fewer than 10% of occupations would see nearly all their required activities automated by existing technologies. So it's, uh, it's becoming more and more about how, how people are going to use the technologies, not that they're necessarily going to be replaced by them. Now, robots and artificially intelligent-powered digital agents 
already rival humans at translating languages, playing strategy games, and even flipping hamburgers. Increasingly, they're able to learn by observing humans rather than simply being programmed by us. And what does, what does this mean? And uh, it, what it means is students will eventually need to learn how to interact effectively with robots and other artificially intelligent agents and not just be afraid that such technologies are going to destroy their jobs and threaten their livelihoods. To be sure, automation will destroy some jobs, there's no doubt about that, but, te but technological advances, if you look back in history, have, have also led to the creation of a lot of new jobs. So the fastest growing jobs, healthcare leads the pack. So a good number of people in my family actually work in the healthcare industry. Uh, my wife and brother are physical therapists and my sister-in-law is a physician's assistant, they can probably be pretty confident their careers are secure for the decades ahead if you, if you look, at, um, if you look at, at, at this breakdown here. But what does this mean for schools? Should everyone be encouraged to, consi be, to consider careers in healthcare? Would it be best for, to direct students away from careers not on the fastest growing list? Those are important questions that have to be asked and they have to be answered. And frankly, I'm glad schools did not take that approach with me. I like what I do uh, and it has worked out quite well for me, even though it probably will, never was and I'm pretty sure it never will be on a fastest growing careers list. The media industry is, you know, tightening. Um, but I could have benefited from more individualized instruction and technology is opening doors for more of that. So intelligent tutors. The bottom line, teachers' jobs are not going away and there have been a number of studies that show that actually teachers are one of the professions that will not be automated out of a job. Uh, but they could be very different due to these types of technologies. And that means future teachers need to be comfortable using them, they need to get they need to uh, you know, get, have the professional development and other opportunities to learn how to use them. Now in this program called STEM AutoTutor, an artificially intelligent computer program for teaching middle school math and science, virtual characters help students think through their goals and different approaches they might try, they might try to solve a problem as well as the procedures they need to know. Artificially intelligent tutoring systems are basically computer programs that model students' psychological states such as frustration as well as their prior knowledge and, personal, and to personalize instruction and that actually is sort of a little bit controversial in some ways. People are concerned that it's yet, yet, you know, yet again more data collection and you have to address those issues. But a 2014 meta-analysis of several different intelligent tutoring systems found they were as effective in helping students learn as a person leading one-on-one -on -one or small group instruction and more effective than full-sized teacher-led classes, workbooks or textbooks or traditional computer-based instruction. And all these workplace trends and technological advances set the stage for the big problem. <laughs> We'll hang on that slide for a second while I get a drink of water. Inside schools, there is uh, uh, tremendous uncertainty, okay? Uh, and it's worth, it's worth reading these. What skills will students need in 5, 10, 20 years? What jobs available now will still be around in 2030? Should every kid learn to code? Some people say coding is going to be, you know, that's not going to be something that's going to be around, even though it's a hot a hot skill right now, um, is a liberal arts education that emphasizes problem solving the way forward. What about apprenticeships, career and technical education, and so-called lifelong learning? And the other one, and this is sort of outside the, sort of the technology realm in some ways, what about school's role in preparing students to participate in the political, civic, and moral debates stirred by technology-driven changes? 
So <laughs> this picture makes me laugh and cry, <laughs> okay? Why technology is not transforming teaching, okay? When we published a story on this topic with this headline a couple years ago, it turned out to be one of the most popular stories of the year, and it continues to pick up readers. A host of national and regional surveys suggest that teachers are far more likely to use technology to make their own jobs easier and to supplement traditional instructional strategies than to put students in control of their own learning. Case study after case study describe a co common pattern in inside schools, actually. A handful of early adopters embrace innovative uses of new technology, while their colleagues make incremental or no changes to what they do at all. Researchers have identified numerous culprits for this challenge or problem, however you want to look at it, <laughs> including teachers' beliefs about what constitutes effective instruction, their lack of technology expertise, erratic training and support from administrators, and federal and state and local policies that offer teachers neither the time nor the incentive to explore and experiment. So if you get a chance, I'd highly encourage you to go to edweek.org and read our, our um, future of work coverage. Part of it is this Faces of the Future um, uh, series that we're doing. So what we're doing, we're profiling highly motivated young people who are trying to take steps to prepare themselves to be essentially future-proof. And the, uh, the boy we profiled here, Ann Michael Brock, he's, a, he's got an incredibly colorful personality, engaging kids, super smart, big ambitions. He's 13 years old. So he wants Chicago kids basically to build the next Silicon Valley. And he's working with his parents um, to organize a trip for Chicago students to Silicon Valley to visit some of the biggest tech companies in the world there so that they get, they get exposed to that kind of you know, uh, idea that they, they can reach that high if they choose to. But last September, frustrated by its lack of computer science classes, Ian left one of the most prestigious public elementary schools in Chicago to be homeschooled. He wanted to personalize his education, basically, to feature more computer science training, computer science learning, uh, and his parents felt that opportunity did not exist for him unless he left the system. They're not anti-public school people. They're doing what they think is best for their kid. And the, what they felt was that a more personalized approach at home would, would, would work better. So this chart, which is kind of hard to see, I tried to make it a little bigger, but it's, it's uh, you know, it, it, but essentially, let me tell you what it says, okay? Um, what, you know, there, there really needs to be much better collaboration among K-12 higher education employers. And that's one of the things that's really fascinating about being here for this conference, is, is though all those, kind of, all those sort of players are here. And I think it's really important to figure out how to make better connections between those systems. And I know there have been a couple of panels that I think touched on those issues here. Uh, so I'd encourage you, you know, whatever you can do to help uh, uh, establish stronger connections in those areas will, will, will help in the long run. So this chart from the McKinsey Global Institute shows the percentage of people with associate or bachelor's degrees per state uh, in 2011 versus the percentage of jobs by state that will need an associate or bachelor's degree by 2020. And basically what it shows is there's a huge gap between um, uh, you know, the projected demand for uh, people with those degrees and those who will have them. So there needs to be some better collaboration in that area. So now we're gonna move to the last section. And I'm gonna take a drink during that section too. The big solution, maybe. And I emphasize maybe. So last fall, as I mentioned earlier, we published a special report that took a very hard and critical look at the personalized learning movement. Um, what, and what we found collectively 
is that turning that far-reaching vision, you know, which is what we, we you know, essentially define as customizing learning to each student's academic strengths and weaknesses and their personal interests, taking that from something crafted by local and state policymakers into actual improvements at the classroom level is going to take a ton of hard work. It is not an easy transition for a lot of reasons. Um, and, you know, and some, you know, the, it, the personalized learning approaches, ex, you know, expanding around the country, they, they also, they vary widely from state to state, from district to district, and even from school to school within a district. And so, so you have, and, and, and it's hard because, you know, you, there might be a school, there are two schools in the same district, they're, they're both doing a good job, but they're doing it very differently, they're taking very different approaches. And uh, you know, some folks in the K-12 world are deeply concerned. It could weaken academic standards and the role of teachers and lead to way too much data collection. But at the same time, others see it as opening the door for much more meaningful and innovative ways to prepare students for the future of work. So I, I uh, this is Willem, not William, it's spelled correctly, <laughs> Willem Hillier. I am an editor. I don't get a lot of opportunities to go out and report on stories anymore. I started as a reporter, but every now and then I decide to get back on the dance floor, and I, I, it's where my roots are, and I love doing that. So I had an opportunity to do that here in Vermont, where I did, you know, got to look at, take a hard look um, at the largest, you know high school in Vermont that is pushing a personalized learning initiative that's part of the state's new personalized learning law. And I met Willem while he was tinkering with a project in which he was programming a saxophone to be self-playing. And he's one of those kids who's so much fun to watch because he, he, he's constantly thinking and moving and iterating. And, and it's, more, it's more intellectual energy than nervous energy. He's just, his mind is constantly working. Uh, and he's taking full advantage of the, of the flexibility that they're trying to build into uh, the program at Champlain Valley Union High School in, in Vermont. And last year, his computer design and engineering teacher he challenged Willem to take on a personalized, a personalized learning engineering project with basically a social purpose, not just a fascinating technological experience, which is what Willem really, he loves those fascinating technological experiences. So using an online program called Instructables, which some of you may be aware of, uh, Willem took a Fisher Price toy car and re-engineered it in, uh, into a working wheelchair for a four-year-old uh, child with physical disabilities. And the final project was featured on a national ABC News show, and the school gave Willem academic credit for two classes, robotics and computer-aided design, no seat time requirements necessary. <laughs> you know, that, so that, that was you know, a really interesting example of how personalized learning can work. So here is the four-year-old girl who benefited from Willem's personalized learning project. And I think a, what I want to talk about here is this is interesting because Willem's teacher played a significant role in encouraging him to look for a project like this. The teacher helped shepherd it, but he did not micromanage it, uh, and he found a way to, and the teacher found a way to ensure that the project got the academic credit it deserved. So the, you know, there are critics who say the teacher, you know, teachers get pushed to the sidelines with personalized learning. This teacher was not pushed to the sidelines with personalized learning. He really, uh, he really took a big role in it. And, and, and it's, wor it's also worth noting that the teacher really wanted Willem to learn more about the connection between empathy and technology. Uh, and, and that's something that the current CEO of Microsoft actually uh, talks about extensively in his new book, Hit Refresh. Uh, I read it uh, after I had uh, done this story, but there, he's really pushing this idea that you really have to empathize with people when you're producing these products and services and understand their, what, their frustrations and what they need. 
So one of my writers, who's, uh, who's a, 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 a very, good, very good reporter, a very strong reporter, really digs deeply into things. As part of, as part of this um, project, we decided we're, we're going to take a hard look at the arguments against personalized learning. And I think if you're a company that's thinking of working in this area, it's really important that you understand these arguments so that you can address them when they come up. And, and the bottom line is there is a growing chorus of critics of personalized learning. Um, you know, so, so you want to know that. So the first one, the hype outweighs the research. No one has studied personalized learning more closely than the RAND Corporation. And RAND is very clear about what its research shows. The evidence base is very weak. Now, it's important to remember that the RAND studies, though, are relatively limited. They involve, I think, a, a charter school network. It's not a lot of regular big districts. But it's schools that have comprehensive personalized learning programs in place. So there, that research is continuing, and we, we're in touch with those researchers. We've done uh, pieces for the personalized learning special report. We've done Q&As in Market Brief about it. If, uh, if you're interested in learning more about it, let us know. So the, the second one, you know, we get accused in the media world of writing headlines to grab people's attention. So we kind of did that a little bit here. But personalized learning is bad for teachers and students, OK? There are people who make, they make that claim. They do. And they believe that what it boils down to is simply kids working alone on software, an approach that they say ignores the crucial social aspects of learning and reduces teachers to the sidelines. The other thing about it that they say is it, when, it, when, it, when technology is overused, that, that learning just gets broken down into these itty bitty little parts and, and it's just not very meaningful. Uh, just be, be aware of that. The other, um, the third one that Ben, uh, exam ben Harold, my writer, examined uh, was big data, plus, uh, big tech plus big data equals big problems. All you have to do is look at what's happened over the past few weeks. I mean, Facebook's recent data privacy problems could escalate worries that personalized learning is a cover for an aggressive push by the tech industry to turn K-12 education into essentially a giant data mining enterprise. We're not saying that. That's what the critics are saying. That's why we looked at it. Now, Ben did not examine this, but I will add a, four, I will add a fourth thing, which I think is important, and that's a decline in academic rigor. Um, the, 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 uh, when I did the story in Vermont, it was interesting how the, the students were engaged and they were doing these personalized projects. And I kept thinking in the back of my head, but how are they going to evaluate these things? How are they going to grade them? And, and, and it seems like you have, a, you have a student like Willem who's doing essentially uh, things that you would be doing if you were working for a technology company or something, which is really high level. But you have another student who could have a complete fluff project and, and doesn't, you know, doesn't learn what they need to learn because there's really no standard or there's no rigor to it. So I would just really you know, pay attention to that argument. So you know, we had these, these four key insights from the RAND researchers. And this is, this is based on a, a Q&A that we published in, in EdWeek Market Brief. Uh, it, and it, and it gets at some of the things I've already talked about, but it's worth just reading them quickly. It's still hard to say what personalizing, personalized learning is and isn't. And in fact, for this special report we did, we did this little crowdsourcing project where we reached out to about three dozen personalized learning experts, critics, state education officials, and others, and asked them, what should personalized learning do and what should it not do? And it was, it, it's a really great, if you're interested in this topic, I recommend you sort of scan through that and take a look, because it gets at what that's saying. On the ground, personalized learning faces real practical constraints. I saw that up close and personal at the school that I, you know, that I visited in Vermont. Our other writers who have traveled around the country have seen that at, uh, at, as well. 
Still, there are reasons to be encouraged, and that's not me saying that. That's the Rand Corporation. Okay, in the in their in their research, they found you know there are certain things that were happening that were having an impact, and that they really cautioned people against being overly critical about personalized learning, because um, there are some you know encouraging signs. And the last one is related to what I just said. The worst fears about personalized learning are often not realized. So like any, like any new movement uh, that starts to gather momentum and excitement and it's, and it's different and it's not being you know, evaluated maybe as much as, as other types of approaches is going to at attract critics, but some of those critics exaggerate those fears be a little bit beyond maybe what, what is really happening in schools. So take a balanced view of when you look at, when you look at personalized learning. So just this morning, um, uh, uh, we published a um, Technology Counts, um, which is our annual uh, report about educational technology. And this year, we conducted a nationally representative survey of 500 principals, assistant principals, and other school leaders about several key ed tech issues. Uh, one of them was personalized learning. The others were screen time, uh, social media, and computer science education. If you go on edweek.org, it's on there in a big way today because we just published it today. Um, the bottom line, principals play a very big and key role in the success or failure of any personalized learning initiative. They, they have to get buy-in from teachers and make, and, and make sure they receive regular ongoing training. They need to make sure the appropriate technologies are available for students and teachers. And they have to ensure that parents understand why a school would embrace this approach. So here are a few results from the survey. Um, you know, uh, one of many school improvement strategies available to me, 31% transformational way to improve public education, 38%, 28% promising idea, 23%. And we looked at, I would encourage you to look at this online because it digs a lot deeper than this and it goes into how they're feeling a little bit of pressure from education companies. Um, and you know, I, I would I would factor that in, you know, when you're if you're working on this type of initiative. So, uh, I think you know, I, I thought about you know what would be the sort of three takeaways from from uh, you know what we just talked about, and I, I'm just going to read these. Um, Despite the uncertainties, many schools are making significant moves to better prepare students for the future of work. That is happening. Schools and policymakers are connecting personalized learning to the future of work. So I saw this in a small way in Vermont, uh, where the, the state education department actually just hired and created a new position in, in the ed department for a workforce development expert. So they're connecting, and that's a state that has a personalized learning law, and now they have a workforce development expert in the state education department. And then the third thing, greater collaboration needs to happen among K-12 higher education and company leaders, as I said before. Those are my three. You can take away a lot of other things from this. I think it's an area that is, is just so open for investigation and learning more. And, uh, and we're, we, we are planning uh, we, this future of work coverage that we have at Ed Week is ongoing and it's going to continue. And we're also planning to do more uh, special reports on personalized learning. So keep your eyes on, uh, keep your eyes on Ed Week. And little shout out to Ed Week Market Brief. I'm the exec, as I said at the outset, I'm the executive editor of Ed Week Market Brief. Uh, we, this is a, a business intel service that uh, we do exclusive survey work about what K-12 district leaders are thinking and the decisions they're making, and, and we try to provide that to senior executives like yourselves uh, so that you can make better decisions about how to serve um, schools. We do very in-depth journalistic analyses of uh, 
trends in, in the market that you should be aware of. We do uh, Q and A's with district administrators and leaders and, and lots of other things that I could go on and on about. But thank you so much, as I said at the outset, for showing up. Like I said, I wasn't sure was, uh, whether I was gonna be talking to myself, but uh, any, any que quick question? Do we have to go outside for questions? Okay, so if you have any questions, I'm gonna be out, out there um, after this. Thank you.